Hi, welcome to Cyphalopod. My name is Corey Clark, and I'm an assistant professor of social psychology at Durham University in England. And this is my co-host, Bo Weingard. I'm at an undisclosed location in Marietta, Ohio, because I'm an assistant professor at Marietta College in Ohio. Mm -hmm. This, I think, is episode five. That might be right. I think so. So today we are going to talk about lots of things, sex differences and the culture wars surrounding sex differences. And the title of our episode today will be the toxicity, wait, what did we decide? <laughs> the, toxi <laughs> <laughs> the toxicity surrounding toxic masculinity and femininity, yes. maybe. Or we'll and change femininity. it. We'll see how the conversation per goes. <laughs> Yeah, parentheses, toxic femininity as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe you should get us started and explain a little bit about sex differences, how they evolved, and why it would be remarkable if there weren't psychological differences between men and women. <laughs> that's wow, a lot. That is that's a, a lot. <laughs> that's a tall task. I hope that we can have some conversation during it, but... Yeah, so put briefly, scholars who are influenced by evolutionary theory think that there would be genetically caused sex differences because of a theory that Darwin forwarded called sexual selection theory. Sexual selection theory looks at the selective forces that are caused by reproductive, specifically caused by reproductive uh, behaviors. So getting a mate, competing with uh, same-sex members to get a mate, etc. There are differences between men and women, and we don't have to go all the way back because it gets more complicated. But if we just focus on, instead of looking at males and females in general, if we just focus on men and women, right, there are enormous differences in what is called obligate parental investment. Obligate parental investment means parental investment investment that one is obligated to make, that one can't avoid. Of course, in modern society, we have the technology that allows us to get an abortion, but for most of human history, or there was no such... Or just birth control to begin with, which is Well, awesome. sure, <laughs> birth control, which is awesome, yeah. But, but for most of human history, of course... Um, an act of sex for a woman potentially meant nine months of pregnancy. And pregnancy is costly for a variety of reasons. One reason is that it, it compels the pregnant woman to get more calories. I want to say it's something like 10 to 15 percent more calories. Obviously, it also is cumbersome. It uh, it's harder to run when you're pregnant. It's harder to collect food. <laughs> well, running from somebody yeah. who wants to, you know, kill you is probably important, right? Yeah. So all sorts of costs associated with this, what we would call obligate parental investment. Males don't have obligate parental investment. So when you look at how would men and women best maximize their reproductive fitness, this is simplifying a bit, and we can obviously get into the complicated details, but it turns out that men are limited by, what would you say, I guess, viable wombs? Yeah, <laughs> so, access so, to yeah, female fertile eggs are women sort of, who are willing yes. to have sex with them. Right, so the female egg is the limiting resource for a male. Whereas mm -hmm. for a female, that's not the case. And one, the way I like to illustrate this is just to think, if you had a society of 100 women and 100 men, and you killed 99 of the men, so you only have one man remaining, he could potentially impregnate every single woman in the community. Whereas if you killed all but one woman, she could only be impregnated by one man roughly a year, and she could not bear the children of all of the men in the community. So there's just this fundamental asymmetry between men and women's like reproductive strategies, as Schmidt and Boss or Boss and Schmidt would call them. 
There are other differences, too, that I think are important in uh, sex behavior that would likely lead to psychological differences, but probably that's the most important difference to begin with. Well, right. So what that would mean is that because men and women face different pressures in their mating because they have completely different strategies for mating, then they should have different psychologies that would make them more successful for the type of strategy that they need to adopt to be successful, right? Correct. And also, and importantly, they also have different, so, so scholar, I mean, this is, we don't need to go too much into this, but scholars distinguish between inter and intrasexual selection. So intrasexual selection is competition with the same sex for access to reproductively viable others. And the way men and women compete amongst themselves is also different, which affects their psychologies. You know, primarily men compete via physical aggression more often than women. Right. Um, and I think probably the point we want to make is just that um, because men are competing for women, they are more likely to engage in violence. They're more risk taking um, because women well, okay, want. But, we but we, we want to talk about what the main psychological differences are between men and women. Oh no, I agree. I'm saying I think we should be careful on the risk taking one because the risk taking. It's important to note that. A, a man can either be a, a big winner or a big loser, whereas right. women are generally like mediocre. A woman's probably going to, you know, have children just by dint of being a woman, whereas a man could have 50 kids or even more if he's Genghis Khan or Julius, well, <laughs> Julius Caesar did it. But if he's Genghis Khan or some king or something or not, right, if he yeah. gets killed in a war or whatever. Or probably Therefore, like Bill risk... Gates, if he wanted to have thousands of kids, yeah, he could. Yeah, if he wanted to. Right, right, exactly. Steve Jobs, etc. Therefore, <laughs> risk-taking, it's, it's, there's a greater re reward for men for taking risks, right? Because if, if the payoff is potentially you have 150 kids, that's a huge reward. Whereas for women, there's never, <laughs> 150 kids aren't waiting for a risk-taking yeah. woman, right? Right. Yeah, because you have to be the women have to be alive to take care of their children usually. So if she dies, that's a problem. Well, that's yeah. So that's one argument is that it's costlier for a woman if she dies. But another point is you are limited by your reproductive machinery. Right. So you're if you're a woman, have like ten kids. Exactly. At most, exactly. Probably. Ten, yeah. fifteen at most. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So yeah, as you were saying, physical aggression, risk taking. Um, obviously they have more musculature, they're better at throwing, they're probably more predisposed to hierarchical relations with broader groups, mm -hmm. other differences that you think are important? Um, probably because women are attracted to men with resources that they would be more ambitious in terms of mm, trying yes. to acquire resources and they would be willing to take greater risks to get greater resources. Yeah, that's a good point. So probably more desirous of status or dominance. Yeah, yes. so you want to think what what would women like in men and then men should be more inclined to be that way and what would men like in women and then women should be more, th their psychology anyway. Although I would like to point out that I've argued somewhat against that model because okay. one argument that I make, and I, I think this, I'll let listeners judge this, but they can <laughs> check out my paper on it as well. What's the paper um, called? Uh, the Status Competition Model of Human Cultural Production, I believe. Okay. And the argument we made is that men mostly, if you look at males traits, both psychological and physical, they seem designed more for intrasexual competition than inter. That is to say, they compete among other men for status, and then they get to choose the women they want. And if you look at women's traits, they appear probably more designed for intersexual selection. That is to say, they are more beautiful to look at. They're the more ornamented sex, and therefore it appears as though they're attempting to appeal to men aesthetically. 
That's provocative. <laughs> that is very provocative. But it is worth noting, I'll just make this note. In most species, just take birds because they're the most obvious example. In most species, it's actually the male that's the sort of gaudy mm-hmm. sex. So if you find a cardinal or something, the male looks better. But in humans, it's the female that's the gaudy sex, which suggests yeah. that there's something interesting about human sexual selection. At least I think that it does. Yeah, that is very interesting because most, when you read about this, it tends to, everyone seems to argue that men are competing for women and women are the choosy ones, but then it is really bizarre that women seem to be more aesthetically pleasing. Although obviously the difference isn't maybe as large as birds where you have pretty dull females and like really um, men and women look kind of similar, but... I think the mistake that a lot of scholars But also make, women work on their appearance more too. But do women Well sure. Women care more about their appearance because it's more important is the restricted, for their main value. But is the restricted fertility of women relative to men common in most species or is that Yeah, that's I mean that's yeah. a crucial component of the sexual so of the parental like Humans investment. live a really long time. Yeah, birds, obviously birds humans probably have, don't I don't no, know. they don't. So obviously humans are different. One, one thing that I think that scholars, um, I think what scholars do often is they, they think about short-term mating more than long-term mating. I, I, yeah, I'm I not you. saying that scholars are stupid or anything. There's obviously brilliant people, but it's easy to see when you think of short-term mating, Clearly, women are the fastidious sex, right? Mm -hmm. So women get to choose on short-term mating. Think, though, when you start to think about long-term mating, you can see that actually men exercise a lot of choice. And I think that's maybe the mistake that some scholars have made, not all. And even, for example, Jeffrey Miller, who wrote one of my favorite books that I actually basically, my paper was just one long argument against, which I like, (laughs) a book that makes you argue the mating mind. He had a mutual mate choice model in there, and he seems a little bit more sympathetic to these views now, I I think, at least. So anyway, um, that's in the weeds if the if the listeners want to check some of that <laughs> literature out. We'll get into more fun culture war stuff, we promise. Yeah. So the issue is that given so so obviously men and women are similar in many different ways and they faced similar evolutionary pressures and that would cause them to have very similar psychologies. However, yes. they also have very unique pressures. And so it would be fairly surprising if those changes were only physical and not also psychological. Um, And it's very impressive if you look at differences between men and women and what sexual selection would predict what men and women should be like. They map on pretty much as you would expect. Um, So, uh, and I don't think, obviously most liberal, liberal social scientists especially, they believe in evolution and they believe in natural and sexual selection and so they would accept that there are some uh psychological differences between men and women that are biological i don't know what the average opinion is of liberals well, there's some s- survey data i think this is from sex and gender scholars though so may- that might be misleading because i don't think this an average social psychologist, let's say, is not a sex and gender scholar. Mm -hmm. But the evidence clearly suggests that sex and gender scholars, they accept natural and sexual selection until it gets to humans, and then they become (laughs) more skeptical about its relevance. And I might point out, this tactic of accepting the physical differences, which Mm -hmm. are so manifestly obvious that one would have to be Know, completely idiotic to deny them but then denying the psychological differences it's quite a gambit it's quite a, a rhetorical technique of course it makes no sense because evolution doesn't stop below the neck right yeah so let's be clear a little bit about maybe the counter argument which would be that men and women maybe so so they would argue that well, there's a bigger wait, what are, what are we trying to forward the counter-argument to what? 
Uh, I guess that's, a, I shouldn't call it a counter argument. That's probably not fair. So what maybe liberal social scientists oh. would argue sure, okay. is um, that there are biological differences between men and yes. women. These are, yeah. a lot of them are physical, fewer of them are psychological, and both psychological and physical are strongly the result of environmental and social features, though they might also be biological to some extent. Yeah, I think if and an e- interaction between the two, between environment. And yeah, that. sure. I think if we take Eagley and Woods mm-hmm. social roles theory, that would be an example of maybe the best argument one could forward from a more constructionist framework. So what they argued was, yes, men and dif- men and women are quite different physically, and because of those physical differences society created certain sex role expectations. Men did certain forms of labor, maybe they hunted, etc. Women did certain forms. And then those expectations get built into society and they greatly affect psychological propensities. Right. I guess what I find implausible about that is, well, first of all, there are behavioral slash psychological differences in every primate, you know, in most primates, so chimpanzees, et cetera, et cetera. And clearly it'd be miraculous if somehow that disappeared during hominin evolution. <laughs> it but just but couldn't the argument sense. apply to them too, because for example, they're different sizes and so they have to do different roles. Um, if men well, are going to be stronger, working... they have to fight more. And so even though they don't have like culture per se in the way humans do, they would still well, have social pressures. Sure, but then you're positing that there's some unique distinction between like physical traits and psychological traits. If a psychological propensity made it more likely that you had repro- higher, you know, made on average led to increased reproductive fitness, then that psychological trait would evolve. I would, I don't, I would think I, so, yeah. <laughs> right. It seems hard. It seems absolutely, you know, near impossible to deny this. However, what you can see what we're getting into is that some scholars, and it seems as though especially liberal scholars, and mm-hmm. in fact, we, you and I have evidence on this and other people do as well, tend to at least minimize especially the psychological differences, Right. Yes, they minimize the psychological differences, but they also minimize um, the biological component of psychological differences. So even if they would say... Well, okay, so let's be... I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want to be... Let's be clear about this, because I don't... I know this this might be uh, captious of me, but when we say biological, I don't like that because it's misleading, because everything's biological, Right. I mean, even if it's socially caused, it's ultimately mediated via biology, right? Yeah, so maybe a better way of explaining it would would be that they, they tend to think a lot of these differences are socially caused. And then if you could right. put people in a different social environment, they would their psychology would be fairly different. That yes. you could actually change people quite a bit. And it's hard because... Right. You, you like it it's hard to say well what's what is actually true how much is caused by social causes versus non-social causes and should we say not very or a lot and what does not very or a lot mean so we're <laughs> sure, not saying sure. that like they're wrong um but i am so, i'm saying they're wrong to me it seems they overemphasize the importance of social causes Yes, and I'm saying in that overemphasis, they are as wrong as one could get. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay. let's go to the, the question here that we have is, of course, I want to be charitable to these people. So I agree. Uh, to these scholars. Uh, so Eagley and Wood, for example, I think are perfectly legitimate scholars who are probably a bit ideologically blinkered, but forwarded a provocative theory At this point, however, I think it's just, it's not a very useful theory. What I would suggest is we think about theory and we use, like, how fruitful is the theory? How much does it explain about the world? And then we can look at data. So if you take sexual selection theory and you use the synthesis that 
um, David Geary forwarded in the magisterial book, Male, Female, it exp- I mean, if you look at the world in every country, it explains all of the differences. Like, you have this theory and you explain the world. Whereas social construction theories, actually their hypotheses get refuted all the time. And then all they're doing is making auxiliary hypotheses to explain why their hypothesis doesn't work. They're not actually explaining new things in the world. So they are they are working with what Lakatos would call a degenerate paradigm, a paradigm that's not actually solving new puzzles. Yeah, sexual selection is much more parsimonious in terms of explaining <laughs> a lot of things in a lot sure of different is. countries uh, over time as well. So it also I was trying to think of example, like what's a really good example of something that it it seems like it should be something that's different between men and women but it's socially caused like i'm trying to think what is a what is it i don't think there is one because i was i was thinking about this and i was it's easy to come up with with examples where like social things don't change what we would have evolved to care about so i was thinking like now we have birth control and men presumably sexual jealousy evolved because men don't want their partners to be impregnated by another man now we have birth control but I doubt that that has made a dent on sexual jealousy. Yeah, it's only whatsoever. been around for it's only been around for like four or five. But but what it says is that men can't like think about the social situation. Right. They can't become are... aware of the fact. Well, if my girlfriend slept with someone, I know she has an IUD. She's not going to get pregnant, so I don't care. Correct. It, it suggests, as I think should be obvious at this point in history, that. A lot of these behaviors and predispositions are not rationally caused. They're not caused by thinking about things. We didn't evolve to think rationally about maximizing fitness. We just evolved predispositions that on average led to higher fitness. And sexual jealousy is a great example. I agree with you. I think some of these things do change behavior, though. I think, for example, it is likely that uh, easy access to birth control changes sexual behavior to a degree. I don't right. think it changes it a lot, but but we can point to what seems better to me is to point to like abject failures of uh, social constructionist models. So, for example, <laughs> <laughs> now this is anecdotal, but we can point. It's it's there are other examples and other. Uh, unique anomalies in the human world that also fit this pattern. There is there was a, a person, David Reimer, and he was born, I want to say he was born Brandon. Is that right? And then he became Brenda. So I think Brandon, maybe Brian. He was a twin and his penis was burnt off when he was getting um, circumcised. Circumcised, yes. And his parents saw a a Dr. John, I I think it was Dr. John Money, it's Dr. Money anyway, who at the time, right, great name, was a proponent of the theory that gender is completely socially constructed. And the parents thought this would be great. You know, what we could do is we could raise the kid as a woman because it's easier to I mean he doesn't have a penis so that would be terrible so we'll raise him as a woman and they consulted with Dr. Money and Dr. Money gave them all this advice about how they should treat him etc etc and one of the things that he told them is never tell Brenda at this point never tell Brenda that she was born a he right because it would be terrible it would I don't know, cause trauma and ruin the whole experiment. And Dr. Money would present on this, and he thought it was a great confirmation of his theory. It turns out that Brenda was getting depressed and was terribly disgusted with her body, especially puberty when she was taking hormones. And finally, the parents told her slash him and What was interesting about the response was it wasn't, I can't believe you did this to me. It wasn't incredulity. It was sort of, I I guess you would say like, 
happy acceptance. Like, okay, this actually explains a lot. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's one example where, you know, people tried to socially construct gender and it seems as though it was an abject failure. I'm sure that there are criticisms one could forward, one could point out as an anecdote, one could point out that the brothers both had depression and various psychological ailments. One could yeah. point out that maybe she wasn't actually socialized exactly as a woman would be, etc. But still, it fits exactly in line with sexual selection predictions and not in line with social construction predictions. Yeah, and you have the same thing with trans people as well. And we kind of accept, at least many liberal social scientists accept that some people are born with a brain that doesn't seem to match their body, which seems to imply that there is a female brain. And these people would, <laughs> right. because they were born, let's say, male, people would treat them like a male, but they felt female nonetheless. So, right. so this is basically, despite uh... being socialized to be the sex that they look like, yet they still have a different psychology right and actually and as you know this is interesting because this is something that liberals champion which mm -hmm. actually seems to be a, a very strong confirmation of the theory of psychological sex differences and in fact a, a repudiation in the strongest way of social construction theory right mm -hmm. because you're born a male and you're treated as though you're a male and in fact what a lot of liberals would argue is you shouldn't treat them as though they're a male because that's bad because they have like a female brain trapped inside a male body. Right. Yeah, it is a little yes. bizarre combination of beliefs <laughs> to think it that some strange... people are born with a male female brain and but females who have female bodies are only female because they're treated female by society. But again, that's yes. that's probably not fair because I'm sure most people say you know it's a combination of things it's just there there's the belief is just that social forces play a really big role i think sure so i mean you know we could put this on some sort of continuum right yeah. it's like how how what proportion of the variance in in men and women's behavior is caused by social forces that's the question that we're you know people are trying to get at Right. It also appears, and here's another, I would call it an abject failure for co social constructionist models. It appears that when you look at countries that are more gender equal, you actually find larger sex differences. Right. And the argument that evolutionary theorists would make about this is it makes sense because when you become more affluent and you have more freedom to pursue what you want to pursue, differences can kind of flower. Whereas they're, you know, stunted in environments in which you're not, that are not as affluent. Right. Now, I, again, there are, you know, there are criticisms of that and there are other interpretations, but I think what you want to do is take all the evidence, put it together and say, what best explains all of this? Each piece of evidence is open to criticism, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so somehow this has become a political issue, it seems. Um, well, most certainly it has, yes. Yeah, I don't entirely know why. I mean, I think, I, I, I get why <coughs> people would oppose, I, I get why people find it appealing to think, well, two things that would be appealing. One is that men and women are basically pretty similar because then you're not at risk of saying that one is better than the other, right? If you say that they're different, it's possible you could eventually end up with coming sure. to the conclusion that one's better. People you, don't like that. Yeah, yes. Of course, yes. you could say they're different and equally good, but right. the, there's a but risk. It, but what, what, once you say they're different, there's a risk that right. one sex's traits are more desirable or better, yeah. I guess you could say. Better in scare quotes. Right. So people would want yes. to avoid that. And then the second reason, I think, um, is that if you say that it's socialization, then you can, if there are any issues, you can fix them, right? Um, if 
men have a particular negative trait or women have a particular negative trait, it's caused by socialization, then we just have to change society, uh, change stereotypes, change the way we treat boys and girls, and and everyone can be like their ideal self or something like what that. What about, I mean, does that relate to um, concern about the causes of disparities between men and women? Yes. Because it seems because as though if it's... one large concern is that, say, men take STEM jobs much more than mm-hmm. women do and that then therefore get paid more. Right. So if it's caused by stereotypes or something, you can get rid of stereotypes and then men and women will be <laughs> equally represented. If women are actually just the... choosing not to go into STEM fields and we very much want women to have autonomy uh... and do what they pursue their own desires, we can't achieve equality in these desirable jobs these jobs that people think are uh people deserve status if they're in a stem field or something they're contributing to society and um they pay better yes we, we should we should note that you were alluding to a particularly what would you say resilient but preposterous theory called stereotype threat i would call it preposterous you might not want to um well it doesn't have to be that it it could just be like sexism on some level or women don't feel comfortable working with tons of men i I understand that there are multiple theories that Mm -hmm. could explain this but i i want to point out something this this does show i think the politics of this issue because this theory forwarded by Steele and others, suggests that when people become aware of stereotypes about them, they conform to them. Yes. Now, why do they do this? I have no idea. (laughs) I believe, though, that doesn't replicate, and people have accepted that. No, it doesn't. It doesn't replicate? I don't think so. They haven't accepted it? It was kind of a big thing a couple years ago. I mean, people still talk about how stereotypes matter, but at least that particular effect, I think. Well, people people say that it's pernicious to stereotype, right? And I think behind that is this idea that if you have this stereotype about a group, for some amazing way, it will cause them to underperform their natural talents. Which, again, the theory doesn't really even make a lot of sense. I think the way Steele articulated it in the original article is that it causes anxiety. I think that's right, yeah. Right, but that's a different mechanism, and I never got the name, because then it's not stereotype threat, really. It's just performance anxiety. Yeah, but it, it would be performance anxiety caused by fear of confirming a stereotype. So no, I think it would that's be caused plausible. by fear of no, no, no. I don't agree with that. It's not fear of conforming to a stereotype. It's confirming. fear of failing. Yeah, no, it's just fear of failing. Yeah, but fear of failing because you you're representing your group in some sense, and you make your group look bad if you confirm the stereotype. It's almost like bringing shame to your group or something. Okay, but again, that's not a stereotype. That's just fear of letting your group down. You could have the same the, theory even but if it's you called got rid stereotype of the stereotype. Threat because I it know. was supposedly caused by making people think about stereotypes. I understand what No, I understand the theory. I agree with you. I'm I'm we're agreeing. I'm saying <laughs> that mechanism makes no sense and if you got rid of the stereotype part of it, you would still have the same explanation. They're afraid of like looking bad for their group or something. The stereotype part seems to add nothing so far as what I can tell. What it adds know. is that stereotypes could increase the odds of that happening. Okay, I don't see. And the that would be the concern. There, but fine. Okay, if, I, I don't. Whatever. See we we don't have to okay, get it into. Doesn't, it <laughs> doesn't matter. Anyway, the point is, we have this theory that's preposterous on its face. I would suggest, and it was very, very, very popular. And if you look at the citations for some of these studies, mm-hmm. they're enormous. And that suggests that there's a big appetite for theories that argue that most sex differences are caused by social forces. You would agree with that, right? I would agree with that. I don't entirely know why 
it, it seems to me that conservatives have been more willing to embrace um, that men and women might be different. And even from a perspective of men are no better than women, they are different, mm -hmm. but equally good. And mm -hmm. women are going to excel at certain things and men might excel at other things. And they're going to kind of balance each other out. And like, they have a much more positive view of, I guess, the state of men and women in modern society. And I don't know. Yeah, is it is actually, it that liberals are point. very disturbed? And that's the only difference. Uh, and it's not actually anything special about conservatives. It's really liberal resistance. Like liberals are the weird ones on that. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, that's a good, that's a really good point because I think the way a liberal would put it is conservatives are, uh, uh, are fond of system genetically justifying. Caused, and... They're fond of genetically caused sex differences because it means that men are better and their place in society is the right place. Like the way we've done things is right and women should be supporting it. But of course, conservatives don't actually think that. And in no, fact, when you listen there's a to lot them of talk evidence. about it, that's not how they sound. Well, right. And you and I, we have evidence that conservatives actually think women are better. Women, or yeah, conservatives seem to display a pro. So that's in our equalitarianism paper, we found that. And then this recent paper that just, I think it's a preprint or maybe it's published now by Keely. I don't know if that's how you pronounce his last name, K T E I L Y, um, mm -hmm. where liberals were far more likely to tweet about Olympic gold medalists who were women than men. And conservatives were too, but liberals were far, far, far more likely to tweet about women than men and conservatives only a little bit. So conservatives still seem to display, and in our work as well, conservatives seem mm -hmm. to display slight pro-female bias, but liberals demonstrate a massive pro-female bias. If we want to call it a bias, and when we say bias, we don't necessarily mean it's morally right, wrong. But Right, we can, we can get into the weeds on bias, but it seems to be the case that contrary to popular narratives, Actually, both conservatives and liberals, if anything, have a slightly pro-woman bias. And in fact, liberals have a pretty large pro-woman bias. Yes. But the important point is that conservatives don't have a pro-male bias. Mm -hmm. But yet, you're right, they're much more comfortable with the notion that there are just genetically caused sex differences. I suppose um, liberals would say... Um because they like tradition and they like things how they are and they don't like progress and they sure. they want they don't want women working they want women to stay home and raise the kids and right and i hear this and then i ask for who are these people who are saying they don't want women to work right i i i mean i'm sure there are some but it's not an opinion that's voiced in mainstream media anywhere right because the mainstream media is comprised of working women who are telling the news stories. <laughs> right. Well, right. We don't want to be here. <laughs> right. Even Fox, right? So right. Fox News has plenty, plenty of, of women. Anchors. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. So basically we have this, this topic. Um, and I, I would say it's, it's almost to the point where it's painful because the sexual selection theory the, the synthesis, as I will call it, the great sex differences synthesis forwarded by Geary in his book, Male, Female, is so powerful that most resistance to it ends up looking ideological. Now, I don't like to impute bad motives. So a lot of these people probably just aren't There's aware of it. certainly power. not bad motives. I think they're actually quite noble. No, 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 no. No, okay. What I mean, I'm sorry, so... Let me clarify, and then you can continue your thought. What I meant was, I'm not saying all of the people are even ideologically motivated. I think a lot of them are just, they aren't aware of the power of sexual selection theory. Now, you can say, I agree with you, there are noble motives for the most part, but you know how I feel about noble motives. They get you on the guillotine in France. <laughs> <laughs> I'm... I'm happy that most people are trying to make the world a better place, but, um, and I think that's what's pro probably driving liberals concerns is they, they see STEM jobs and they think those are great jobs. They pay really well. We would like more women in those jobs. And so sure. really it would be ideal if the solution was something we could fix. Um, and that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, right, but, but isn't that, I think, think that it is degrading. I, I've, I've, I've thought of, 
Well, you can say what you're going to say. So I was going to. Oh yeah. Do you do you think that is in some sense that that's degrading to women because it's suggesting that if women, so it appears as though when women have the freedom to choose the careers they want. They prefer careers in which they get to interact with other humans mm -hmm. and in which they can have valuable family time. And, mm -hmm. and they have they report high levels of well-being when they get those kinds of jobs. Right. And so it seems a bit degrading to women to suggest that when they're making, you know, that it's a mistake. It's right. a socially created mistake that I, causes them to do that. It's that's a it's a. It's a tricky problem because certainly I think liberals, people who are like advocates for getting women in STEM fields, for example, they well, what, certainly what? wouldn't say it's bad for women to pursue what they want to do if they want to be nurses, these types of more like stereotypically female jobs where they take care of people and they're really happy. They only want to work 30 hours a week because they want to spend a lot of time with their kids. They would not, they would say that's that's awesome. They would be very supportive of that. What their concern is, is that there are other women who would get satisfaction from these other careers and they would make um, higher salaries and that would make them feel good. And they're, mm -hmm. they're being kept out. Okay, and they're so just let, trying to let, find these women. Let me be clear. I'm not talking about people like obviously it's good to attempt to recruit talented people into STEM fields. So, I mean, nobody's saying we shouldn't do that. So that's, we don't need to spend time on that. Now, what you're saying is, well, what these people are concerned with is the people who lose opportunities. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 we should be concerned about that. I think. And then furthermore, I'll even go further. And here I'll lose some of my heterodox friends. <laughs> <laughs> I will suggest there is probably a kind of bro culture in some of these fields that is off-putting to women and that we should pay attention to. Yeah, that's probably true. Um, which, so, is, which is what I find pretty fascinating is that I, I honestly think liberals and conservatives on these issues agree for the most part they just use vague adjectives about how big of a problem these problems are. I mean, granted, so I think I think probably liberals would would like a 50 50 representation, uh, whereas conservatives would be happy with whatever amount where women want to however many women want to be there and, you know, pick the best people or something like that. And they, they would be happy with yeah. the, an uneven distribution. So maybe that is a an actual point that they cannot agree on i think you're being too charitable to liberals here so i i have conservative views and i have liberal views here mm -hmm. i think liberals are just wrong and by liberals i mean let, let me say progressives i don't want to use the term liberal yeah. because the progressives are just wrong they're wrong about the underlying theory their underlying theory of human nature is wrong and it leads to the assumption that disparity equals discrimination when it certainly doesn't. Right, but even some of the like most progressive social psychology professors I know would admit mm -hmm. that that when you find different levels of or if you have a if men and women aren't perfectly represented in a particular field, that doesn't necessarily mean discrimination. Okay, so that's fair. I don't know these progressive professors you're referring to. I do know that I've read plenty of literature and I've been involved in plenty of conversations in which the underlying assumption was disparity equals discrimination. So and probably, I, I think, probably some people think that, but I sure it, I don't I don't know if that's the majority view. I, I don't either. It's hard to say, right? But yeah, so I would agree with you, that that what, that's pretty wrong. Um, what do you what do you think about the probably the more controversial claim for listeners here, right? Because I'm guessing our listeners are hostile to progressivism listener. for the most part. <laughs> or our one listener, Andy. yeah. <laughs> it's Andy. We we heard he doesn't like progressivism. <laughs> um, what about the what about the see the bro culture thing to me is something that I I 
would hope that liberals and conservatives could agree on. It's something that we could actually focus on and do more about. We're not going to change innate preferences or, you know, probably not. Bro culture, we can change. Yeah, so that's something you could criticize conservatives for because I think they they can look at a solution like, well, it's because it's due to different preferences, and they're like, good, we're done here. We don't need to worry about any problems with like why women who want to go in these fields might be um, might might not pursue them because they're not comfortable being around tons of men all the time, particularly if they're being gross and they're being sexual and things like that. Well, Right. So let's be like, let's articulate what, why you would get a bro culture. So let's suppose that you have a high powered field and it's 85% men, 15% women. So what do men do when there are a few women around and there are lots of men around? We've all seen this. It happens in elementary school, middle school, high school, your workplace, etc. They start to engage in intrasexual competition which means they start to act in ways they compete with each other. They make off color jokes often, right? Would yeah, you that's agree? kind they, of they weird encourage... though, because if they're trying to impress women, like why would they tell offensive jokes that would see I think this, this is why my, this is why I think the status competition model, again, they're not trying to impress the women. They're trying to impress the other men. Yeah. Right. And so demeaning yeah. women. So in impressing fact, the demeaning... men to gain status among the men because then they right. get the women. Yeah. Right. That's why you get this weird culture <clears throat> of, of Yeah, like look at demeaning. Donald Trump, for example. Like he gained status among men pretty much only, and then that's why women well, why he's probably slept with many, many, many beautiful women in his life. <laughs> it's not because right. women are like, Oh, he's so charming. I'm I'm guessing. I... I hope it's not. I don't know. But yes, that's why I think you can get these culture. And I'm look, I'm not saying that uh, an economics department is full of people who derogate women all the time. But you can get these kind of cultures in which demeaning women is perfectly accepted. And it's not because that's how you impress women. It's because that's how you show the other guys that you're so cool. You don't care about the women. Okay, maybe, I don't... Well, why else would you do it? Like, take, for example... Well, why lyrics. is it not caring about the women? Like, because when you display to your male coalitional partners that you you don't care about women, and what you're basically saying is, one, I'm committed to male coalitions, but two, I don't have to care about women, and they'll still come to me, or I'll still pick them up. Okay, I think maybe. that's what it is. I mean, I, I'm throwing that out. I guess that's a novel. We could write a paper on it. Rap <laughs> lyrics and signaling. <laughs> yeah. Because there is definitely this sort of culture of demeaning women, especially like, you, again, you notice it in some rap lyrics in which people seem to compete about how how much they can denigrate women. It seems to me that you're saying, I don't care about women. Like, I'm not mm -hmm. one of those people who, I don't spend my, like, think about men who care about women's feelings. A lot of men make fun of them. If you're a man and you spend an hour getting ready so you look pretty, people make fun of you. They call you a pretty boy, a dandy, a coxcomb, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, you're not supposed to try. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, an interesting idea. Somebody's probably had this idea anyway, but it's just an idea. So going from this bro culture, perhaps we can talk about a scary term, toxic, toxic. masculinity, toxic, <laughs> Good job. it's a toxic term. <laughs> yeah, so toxic masculinity, uh, a lot of people have been talking about this lately um for a while but then i think the gillette ad is really what pushed people over the edge and now it's more political than it was i think a few weeks ago um where yeah, conservatives well, are 
they see many of them seem very offended by the concept. Well, maybe we should define the concept. So, yeah, so th let's talk about the Gillette ad first, and then maybe we'll work backward because the Gillette ad does use the word toxic or the phrase toxic masculinity one. So there's this Gillette ad, it comes out on the heels of an APA guidelines report about boys and men. Um, the Gillette commercial basically suggests that society is letting boys and men down by mm. not don't you think i mean i think what people were offended what some... no no well we're not i'm not concerned with that okay I, let's articulate what the commercial did first and then we can talk about the offense right okay so how about you give it a whirl since you seem to disagree <laughs> with my characterization <laughs> well the i think what the what they were saying was like is this the best men can get or something and it showed men engaging in lots of um, negative behaviors like um, being aggressive getting in fights with other people um, shouting at women but what it also showed was men sort of intervening um, trying to get their friend to not cat call trying to get their son to not get in a fight um, yeah that so... was the second half of the commercial so the first half is the sort of stereotypically boys will be boys and in fact they use mm -hmm. that phrase behaviors mansplaining is one boys fighting and um somebody gawking at a woman right and some bullying and then in the second half it shows like people intervening other men intervening to say hey that's not cool right mm -hmm. and the idea is let's be better as men and there's this phrase that also when we get into why people were offended by it it says some men are like this, but some isn't enough, mm -hmm. right? Which people took, of, they thought that was offensive too. So that's the basics of the ad, right? Yeah. So some people considered it to basically be an assault on masculinity and saying that masculinity is kind of inherently bad or something and that we shouldn't let mm -hmm. men be masculine and we should try to discourage them from being masculine although it, it, yeah it's a little bit tricky because i don't think anyone is no one's defending any of the actions that the people in the commercial are doing they're not saying like it's fine to cat call or it's fine to you know bully other people but they're saying that i guess more often than not these types of masculine traits are good things um it's good that men are strong um that um men are dominant or something and that that that's I don't, I don't typically know used people... for good in the real world that I masculine mean, I would traits say, tend to be used for good i would say though i mean we can get into the specifics of the commercial i think the boy the five-year-old boys like fighting or whatever probably isn't that big of a deal and like I think the, the main criticism people would forward is most people don't accept this kind of behavior anyway. Like parents don't just let their kids fight with other kids and be like, whatever. Right. <laughs> and so a lot of the criticism was you had this, this particular tableau in which there were a bunch of men lined up with their barbecue grills. And these are, you know, basically representations of middle-class bourgeois men just sitting there doing nothing yeah. while the boys fight or whatever. And I think people were upset because they thought that that was an unfair depiction of what men actually do in the world. And then, as you said, I think as you articulated quite well, also people just felt as though it was assailing masculinity. Yeah, right, and I general, think also they, right. they thought, why are we singling men out? We don't right. want anyone bullying anyone, men or women. So why are we right. making it seem like a man thing? Or like, we don't want anyone being disrespectful to other people. So why do we make it seem like a man thing? Um, right. And so this concept of toxic masculinity, which makes an appearance in the ad to the discomfort of many people who view it as kind of a a feminist propaganda term, 
th this term actually, though, I think is perfectly useful. And I don't know if you agree with me. I'm not, I don't remember. There probably could be a better what term, we think. but possibly you go but ahead we'll, we'll, and make your. Yeah, we'll talk about this. So the, the origin, as far as I can tell, the origin of this term is from a Terry Cooper's paper about why men in prison don't seek help. And whatever the empirical details of the paper, and I would disagree with a lot of it, the concept comes out of this sort of tradition of uh, male uh, of, of gender studies and of hegemonic masculinity is the idea. And the argument is some components of masculinity are, are healthy and good for society, mm -hmm. wanting respect, trying to get status, um, asserting your opinion, uh, being courageous, etc. But mm -hmm. some of these can become corroded and bec become toxic. And those would be that seeking dominance, being mm -hmm. physically aggressive, being afraid to accept vulnerability or admit mm -hmm. vulnerability, etc. Okay. And, uh, or, you know, being homophobic, picking on people who, you know, men who are effeminate or weaker, etc. And it seems to me, and the reason I defend the term is because I think that there's a lot of truth to that. So let's point something out. A lot of the criticism that we that is forwarded about these concepts of toxic masculinity and other, you know, assaults on manhood, a lot of the criticism argues that these theories are based on blank slate views of sex differences, right? Mm -hmm. Which you and I were talking about uh, earlier, this idea that most sex differences are socially constructed. And so these criticisms say, look, like that theory is wrong, obviously. And I think, therefore, it's supposed to follow that any concept based on that theory is therefore wrong. But what I would argue is that and I'm sorry, I, I know I'm going on a dialogue here. I'll, I'll try, not, di not dialogue, monologue. Yeah, that's fact. fine. I'll, I'll try to, to put an end to it really quickly. <laughs> that was fair. Uh, okay, so what I would argue is... You're mansplaining me. I am mansplaining. That would, we can have that as the title. I mansplain to you on our on our podcast. On so, masculinity. <laughs> right, I, Bo I am representing toxic podcast. masculinity. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> so b basically what I would argue is, no, there are definitely genetically caused sex differences and men do have these propensities toward behaviors that we no longer want in society, such mm -hmm. as bullying people, such as dominance, such as sexually harassing subordinates. And that is toxic masculinity. And the reason it's called masculinity is because it's like, one area of behavior that men can men's propensities can lead. However, what we can do is we can attempt to tame and discipline those propensities and mm -hmm. guide them into more productive routes, such as uh, achievement pride, being nice to people, being respectful, being patriotic, helping the family, etc. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would argue. I I don't understand the hostility toward the term, frankly, I find it bizarre. So let's be clear. So what you're saying is that it seems that the critics of the term toxic masculinity are accusing the proponents of the term of embracing the concept because they have this blank slate view of... At least partially, yes. Partially, of yes. Uh, men and women. But in fact, yeah. it would be that because males have a nature and a nature that differs from females, it actually does yes. make sense to isolate men on this particular issue and say men have some traits, men um, are more aggressive, men are far more likely to rape and murder, men are more likely yes. to do physical bullying, men yes. get involved in unnecessary wars, um, problems that we don't have with women so much and so it actually does make sense given that these are male traits to right. criticize them about men specifically yes. yeah yes and, but and but but don't would, you think maybe the choice of the word masculinity is a bad one because it kind of broadly it's, it's supposed to broadly explain 
manliness in general? Like, why can't you say aggre- like toxic aggression in men or something? Because toxic masculinity is a better word than it is toxic a, aggression. It is a catchier, better phrase, it's a catchier a better phrase, phrase but you can imagine people probably wouldn't be arguing over something like, let's deal with um ag- aggression in men let's well let's... well let's set that let's set that aside for a second uh, mm-hmm. for well for a minute I, I would say furthermore on what you said i agreed with everything you said and i would add that men are the primary victims of men's behaviors yes so, so this isn't is like true. some sort of there's this accusation that this is i don't know feminist propaganda but in fact men have always been the primary victims of men's aggression and violence. And yes. therefore, if we care about men, we should care about curbing some of these kinds of behaviors. What was the, what was the other? Oh, I, I, so your point was, well, why don't we just say, you know, I don't know. Um, we should concern ourselves with aggression in men rather than coming up with this term can, toxic masculinity yeah we can pick out there are traits that fall in the domain of masculinity that we want to sure. uh celebrate and encourage and there are mm-hmm. others that we would like to discourage probably the main one being physical aggression and sexual sure. violence that type of sexual violence, sexual yeah, misconduct absolutely. in general or whatever right those would be the two so why can't we I, make it about that and not almost make the the discussion be about masculinity which is pretty much just what makes men men or something the quality that is describes men i i I suppose that's there's I, i i mean that's fair although i think two things about it one it's bizarre to me that facts don't care about your feelings crowd the facts don't care about your feelings crowd right are the ones who are predominantly concerned about this term because the fact of the matter is it's just a fact that men do have these predispositions that lead them to commit more crimes and to be more violent in general and these are masculine on average they are masculine traits and that's what masculine means it just means on average men are more associated with these traits no one's saying all masculinity is toxic in fact what we're trying to do is subdivide the toxic component mm-hmm. from the authentic or prideful masculinity or the you know the good masculinity i think there so is it, there's a concern about it being too broad and i would say even in the case of aggression we would mm-hmm. say it it in many cases it has been a good thing that men have been willing to go to war and kill absolutely. other people who were absolutely. killing more people so we want to minimize yeah so so i think there's a concern that if you critique or if you criticize masculinity in general it feels like you're throwing you know the good out with the bad but you're it seems to me that this is engaging in tactics that progressives often do you Mm -hmm. it's an argument that nobody well let me rephrase that some people might but Nobody who respectfully uses the term toxic masculinity is assailing all men. In fact, quite the opposite. What they're attempting to do is distinguish the the positive forms of masculinity from the negative forms. And I agree with you. It's absolutely crucial for a society to have people who are willing to engage in violence. And that has been men for most of human history. And that's a good thing. I think, societies. though, I think I probably agree. a major part of the disagreement comes from using the word masculinity because it feels I like agree. it's too broad. So I think everyone would agree we want men to kill other men less and we want men to rape <laughs> I, women I less. <laughs> yes. So it's really just. Well, you know, I'm not. OK, I agree with that. But I will say I've had. Twitter disputations with people who were not like unreasonable in general, who maintain my argument is some masculine, some male propensities are particularly maladaptive Mm -hmm. in modern societies Mm and modern Pacific societies, societies in which you don't need dominance anymore. 
and in which, in fact, dominant behaviors are often ruinous to your group cohesion. And I got pushback even on that, even that. Yeah, but I think that might be because I think that might be because it's political now. And so people just are going to fight against it. Well, that doesn't mean I have to I have to resign myself to the stupidity. I can't (laughs) help. You know, like if if these people want to say facts don't care about your feelings. okay, that I agree. Let's talk about the facts and the facts. Again, I'm not saying like men are worse or anything. It's just. So, like, look, if men had their way, let's just say you didn't have like rules and norms, mm-hmm. men would definitely engage in a lot more sex crimes than they do now. The only reason they don't, this isn't anti man, it's just a fact which doesn't care about your feelings. The only reason they don't is because we have very powerful norms and pu- public shaming and the law mm-hmm. preventing them from doing it. Yeah. Right? Same thing with bullying. Men are boys are going to physically bully other boys. Now the question is, how harmful is that really? Right? I think that's a legitimate discussion because in the Gillette ad, it's like six year olds roughhousing, and mm-hmm. like that actually is probably good for boys. They like to do that. I don't know. I used do to... we have any evidence that it's good? I don't. I don't think we do. But do we have evidence that it's bad? I would say if we don't know if it's good or bad, then probably better not to have them beating up on each other. Because at minimum, they can sustain physical harm. And so we know that there's at least some risk. Okay, but then you can say better people don't jump on a trampoline because we don't know if it's good for them, but we know you can be physically harmed. It's fun. No, we don't. Right? So fighting is fun for boys. That's what they do. My, My... it's my fun for the person friend, who's winning, probably. No, my best friend Todd and I, we, he used to come over and we would we would kickbox. That was, like, fun for us. And, <laughs> yeah, once in a while you'd get hit in the face and you'd start crying and then you would stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I we're, think, we're running out of time here, so I just... No, this is really important. <laughs> Kickboxing... <laughs> God. Todd. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just wanted to mention really quick that I think like w- Wait, one what of time are we at? 107. Oh man, okay. I know, All we right. talk too much. All right. All right. Um one thing that seems to bother people is that we're critiquing masculinity but not femininity femininity. Yeah, so a... And I thought you yeah. brought up a really interesting example the other day um about the movie Mean Girls, which was like Tina Fey's movie she's probably super liberal I'm guessing and liberals probably love yes. that movie and the whole thing is basically just making fun of the negative traits of women yes. and the message is about how can we make women better um, and women have right. been you know teased for being gossips and for being catty and all these things and it, it right. it's the same it's the same type of thing it's like how can we create a society that um punishes in some sense the negative traits that women have and also the negative ones that men have to make and them. rewards the positive and reward right? the positive yeah yeah, yeah. And women I, are I really caring and we want to support right, that because we we don't watch like people don't watch mean girls and think oh this is an assault on all women and yeah. in fact although yeah, if it came so, out today maybe they well, would it, but it, notice that if a progressive said that if a progressive said mean girls is an attack on all women all of these people who are currently saying the Gillette ad attacks all men would be chastising those people for making it about all women because it's not about all women. And when you watch it, it's clear that what it's about is the certain toxic traits that women have, but it's about like, let's help women be better because mm-hmm. women are the primary victims of right. gossip, right? And the same way men are the primary victims of uh, male aggression. Now, I mm-hmm. should say, I am a certified legitimate beta male. So <laughs> it's possible, <laughs> it is possible that my being a soy boy has something to do with my views on masculinity, although I do think they're completely grounded in empirical fact, and I'm perfectly willing to talk about the facts. Cool. Do you have anything you would like to add? Um. No. <laughs>
<laughs> You're not going to thumb splain to me? <laughs> no, I think I'm good. Okay, well, I've probably mansplained enough in yeah, this yeah. podcast for the ironic title, so <laughs> I'm, I'm good with it. <laughs> All right, I'll talk to you later. All right.